What we are talking about today is one of those things that 10, 20, maybe even 50 years down the line, we'll look back at historically and it would be ah that first overturn point, that first record of a terrible milestone that we crossed. Today we know that there are a lot of business transactions attempting to quote-unquote offset their emissions by planting a tree. In fact, trees are such a central part of our climate and emissions discourse, right? The reasoning is that trees absorb emissions. Well, trees absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. So the logic is that we increase emissions as long as there are trees sucking them back because otherwise greenhouse and toxic gases would just simply build up in the atmosphere with no way to remove them. Trees are currently removing them. They act as a carbon sink. They are a part of the terrestrial or land-based sink which absorbs carbon from the atmosphere and stores it. They pull all the carbon and keep it within themselves which is good for us and for the planet. The soil also absorbs carbon. The ocean is the largest absorber of carbon and that's why oceans heat up really fast. But on land, it's soil and vegetation. In fact, oceans and vegetation are considered to be the two largest carbon sinks and soil is also a very crucial medium to store carbon. So really, in extremely oversimplified terms, what happens is that every year, vegetation absorbs X amount of carbon from the atmosphere and stores it. We emit polluting gases, of which a part gets absorbed by trees. So the overall amount of carbon in the atmosphere varies and we think that what we emit can get absorbed. There is inflow of carbon into the atmosphere in the form of emissions and there is reduction in the form of sinks. So, well, the fossil fuel logic is that we can emit, but as long as we have plans to keep sucking it back up, we're okay. In fact, oceans, forests and soil combined absorb about half of all emissions. Half. Despite the egregious situation that we are in today, half of our emissions get absorbed by natural carbon sinks. So, imagine what would happen if these sinks fail. Well, it began last year. This cycle of vegetation absorbing carbon has stopped. It's not that the vegetation did not absorb carbon, they continued functioning as normal, all the trees and forests, but the amount of cumulative emissions has become so high that the sink is no longer effective. It's not making a difference. So basically, we are no longer able to remove enough carbon from the atmosphere to make a net difference. Remember, trees also breathe, so they also release carbon dioxide while taking in oxygen. So net zero, no longer possible. This happened for the first time in 2023. Vegetation and soil absorbed almost no net carbon the whole year. Why? Literally, nothing new. We know emissions are going up and we know that we are in the throes of a huge planetary scale emergency, which we are not treating it as such. Some consequences of this has indeed worsened the land sinks over the past year, but there are additional factors. 2023 was the hottest year on record. There was excess drought, this led to the topsoil drying and not absorbing enough carbon. It led to trees dying and lack of water leading to reduced carbon uptake capacity in trees. And there were lots and lots and lots of wildfires across the planet last year. In fact, over the last year. So scientists are now concerned that the carbon sink process is breaking down. 2023's effect could be temporary if the wildfires and droughts reduce, but the collapse of carbon sink is also inevitable at the rate at which we're going. These signs are even scarier indicators of what is to come because of the last 12 months. Two major, major sources of newer, very large-scale, unprecedented emissions formed last year. One is Israel's, let's say, assault on Palestine. Emissions from just the first 120 days since October of 2023 is more than the total annual emissions of 26 countries combined. 
This we know has worsened much more because it's not been just 120 days, it's been over a year. And even if land toxicity and waterborne diseases that are spreading in Gaza won't affect people in the rest of the world, the emissions, atmospheric emissions definitely will. The second, of course, is generative AI. Using ChatGPT to generate 100 words consumes up to 3 liters of water. In 2019 itself, much before all of this came out, engineers figured out that using a generative AI model, a very specific one with limited parameters, consumed the energy of a full round trip from Europe to America for one person. Using generative AI to make images drains swimming pools worth amount of water for one image. Companies like Google are using up water supplies of entire cities to cool equipment in their data centers. Google, Microsoft and all these companies are now basically turning on nuclear power plants to power generative AI and all the equipment it uses and is also draining water for forests and agriculture and drinking in the process to just create Gaussian blur slop. And most of these companies, if not all, have walked back on their net zero and climate targets. Trees need water, of course, and different parts of the Earth system are not disconnected. So this does affect trees as well. And not just that, the process of drawing water itself leads to emissions. So all in all, 2023-2024 in climate history is going to stand out as one of those years where a multitude of things overturned for the Earth's natural systems. Now, why am I saying this with so much confidence? Because climate scientists are saying these things with a lot of confidence. They are crying on news channels trying to bring attention to these topics. And why are climate scientists so confident about all of this doom and gloom? I'll give a small perspective on this. One of the largest problems with climate modeling is that, of course, it's quite complex because there are like some 10 quintillion parameters that need to be factored in and we don't really understand all of them. So the science itself is extremely complicated. But one of the main findings that we have seen consistently when it comes to climate predictions over the last few years, in fact, the last couple of decades, is that even climate models, even the most sophisticated models, most extreme predictions are turning out to be pretty conservative when it comes to real life. Our most extreme predictions have been nothing when it compares to what happens in reality. And this year, many, many, many more records were broken, whether it comes to the most theoretically extreme amplification of a cyclone already occurring or unprecedented rains and floods. There are droughts and wildfires and ocean temperatures and atmospheric temperatures that humans have not seen before. Now, all of these findings and these climate records that are being broken, it would be amazing if these are exceptions. And they can be, maybe, over the long term because we process climate data over decadal time periods. So when we look at 10 years worth or 20 years worth of data, we understand better the implications of these spikes in findings. But the last year is definitely going to stand out as the beginning of some sort of increased spike in emissions and in general the collapse of Earth systems because of the sheer unprecedented scales at which these extremes are happening even if they are measured over decadal timescales, over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years. And one of the things that we will remember 2023-2024 for, among many things, including the terrifying and seemingly inevitable AMOC collapse data, is the first ever suspension and failure of global carbon sink for net carbon emissions.